Hi, I'm Rob from Producer Tech, and on this course I'll be teaching you everything you need to know to start producing or performing with Ableton Live. We'll be going through all of the main stages of making a track, from getting started right through to exporting the final mix, showing a wide variety of musical styles along the way. Accompanying the lessons, which you can have access to for as long as you need, are written notes and live projects that you can download and then refer to whenever you want to take a closer look at all of the techniques taught on the course. If you get stuck at any point, you can hit me up on the forum or over email to ask questions. The course is designed for complete beginners as well as those with some experience already, so don't worry if you've got no musical knowledge at this point, as you'll learn plenty of music theory as well as production skills as you go. In this first lesson, I'm just going to give you an overview of live, so you have a better understanding of the overall layout and functionality, and what each of the main areas of the software does. Let's check it out. Here's a project for a track I've been working on recently then. It's not too complex, having a nice manageable number of tracks, but this often makes the mix clearer and more powerful. At the moment we're looking at Arrangement View, which is the more traditional display mode, as it shows how the song is constructed. Each one of these tracks, with named headers on the right, contains different audio or MIDI clips, which are the building blocks of the song. These could be anything from samples I've imported, or vocals or instruments I've recorded, to software instruments either from Live's collection or made by other plug-in manufacturers. Then if I click with the mouse anywhere below the timeline, or bar ruler, showing me the number of bars at various points, the song will play from that position. And I can zoom in and out and move left or right by clicking above the bar ruler. Now the main groove is rolling, I can show you two of the elements creating it. Firstly, the bass sound was made by playing an external synth, which I recorded onto an audio track to make a 4 bar loop, which you can hear more clearly if I hit the solo button on the track. Whereas the main lead sound playing over the top is one of Live's software instruments, being triggered by a MIDI clip, which is simply a block of MIDI note information which can be created by playing a MIDI controller keyboard or your computer keyboard, or simply by drawing in notes. And each of these tracks has different audio effects on, to shape and transform the sound of each part, shown in the track's device chain at the bottom of the window. The tracks can also be viewed from the other main display mode, which has all of the tracks running side by side rather than on top of one another, with enlarged level and panning controls that resemble a mixer you might find in a recording studio. So this provides you with easier controls to adjust and a clearer display of what's going on in your mix. Like an arrangement view, the window can be fully customised to look the way you want, using the arrow switches in the corners to fold sections away for example whilst the small switches to the right of the faders can be turned on and off to allow you to simplify the display if you're not using certain controls. This view mode also features Live's Grid, which is one of the most fantastic and unique aspects of the software, as it provides both an excellent performance platform as well as a great starting point for making a song. Here, rather than clips being laid out along a timeline, they can be placed anywhere in the grid, and then played in any combinations, all synchronised to your session tempo. So it's a really awesome way of coming up with ideas, or creating a set to play out. It's also really easy to transfer clips from one view mode to the other. Switching between displays can either be done with the tab key, or using the switches in the top right. These switches also allow you to drag clips from one view mode to the other. Or, even easier than that, you can hit record on the transport, and record them directly into the arrangement. After which, I just hit the Back to Arrangement switch to check out the mini recording I just made. Along the top of the screen you have the control bar, which contains many of the global controls for your session. So far, I've been using the main transport controls to stop, play and also record. 
but up here we also have various tempo settings, such as the speed in beats per minute the project is currently running at, and the time signature, which is the standard four crotchet beats per bar, as well as the metronome controls that allow you to hear that beat nice and clearly. Then over on the right, there are controls that allow you to loop a portion of the arrangement, which are even more easily set using the bracket below. The other display at the bottom of the live window is the clip editor, which is where you view and edit any of the clips on a track, either an arrangement or session view. And this is one of the sections that can be enlarged to make it easier to see. So here you can change their level, pitch or timing, or if they're MIDI clips, then you can edit the notes that are being played. But I'm sure at this point you're going into information overload, so let's end the quick tour there so I can show you a few things to help you get started with a new session. Whenever you open up any new audio software, you'll want to set up various things in the preferences, which will allow you to configure your setup in order to route sound from the software to speakers, for example, or maybe control the software using a MIDI control surface, or to activate your plugins folders so they appear in live, and also choose other options that determine how the software looks and functions. The Preferences window is opened by selecting Preferences from the Live menu, or hitting the associated keyboard shortcut, in this case Command and Comma. Once it's open, you can choose what preferences you'd like to look at. A good place to start is the Audio tab, where you can see your audio devices at the top. Here you can select the audio input and output device. If you're simply wanting to hear the software using the computer's speakers, or by connecting headphones to the computer's mini jack output, then you can choose built-in output for the audio output device option here. But if you have an audio interface connected, which will allow you to more easily route a high quality signal to speakers, then you can choose that from the pop-up menu instead. If the interface has inputs, then you can also choose it for the option above if you want to record audio from it. But we'll look at that more in the audio recording module later on. If you can't find your interface in the list, then you might need to choose a different driver type at the top. This defaults to Core Audio for a Mac and ASIO for a PC, as they're the most common types. Below this, you have other audio options, one being the sample rate. This is the number of samples per second that Live and your audio interface are working at. 44.1 kHz is the standard setting and is the sample rate of digital audio on a CD, so is high quality audio. Setting a higher option here basically means any recordings you make will have higher file sizes, rather than necessarily sounding better. These higher rates are more of a concern of huge studios with untold amounts of hard disks, or those with golden ears who can hear the very subtle difference the higher sample rate makes. Although Live resamples audio, so you shouldn't in theory have to concern yourself with the sample rate, I have occasionally had a problem with the pitch of audio when I've plugged an audio interface in that's been rectified by switching between 44.1k and 48k, so that's something you should be aware of in case it happens to you. Also, again although this is quite a technical detail, below this you can see the buffer size of your interface. Most computers these days are fast enough for you not to have to worry about this, especially if your project isn't packed with high CPU plugins and tons of audio files. But if you find your computers glitching and dropping out occasionally when you play your session, then this can normally be fixed by increasing the buffer size. This basically adds more of a delay to the audio you're hearing, meaning your computer doesn't need to work as fast, which is fine in most situations. Some other settings you might want to check out are under the MIDI tab, where you can see the input and output settings of any MIDI devices you have connected. If you've just got a standard MIDI controller keyboard, then you shouldn't have to worry about this section, as Live normally detects any MIDI information automatically. However, you might need to turn on the input's track or remote options, depending on whether you're wanting to use the keyboard just to play instruments, which is the track option, or also remote control the software, so adjust any areas of the software using knobs and buttons on the controller, which is the remote option. If you have a more advanced control surface with sophisticated integration with Live, then you may be able to select it in the list at the top, and then choose the relevant input and output ports. For more detailed instructions about that, you'll have to check your controller's setup guide. If you want to use any external plugins with Live, which are software instruments and effects in AU or VST format, then you'll need to turn on the relevant folders in the Plugin Sources section of the File Folder Preferences. 
This is done with the first two on off switches. As well as two switches below that for turning on and then setting a custom VST folder. If you have some plugins located somewhere other than the standard system folders. Finally, I'll just show you a few settings under the Look Feel tab, where you can do things like change the appearance of the software by choosing a different skin. And you can also change the brightness, as well as manually set the color intensity and hue to find something that works best for you. Now let's take a more detailed look at Live's browser, which you can open up by clicking on the arrow in the top left corner, and then resize by dragging the edge. This is where you can find any files to be used with Live, be they instrument presets, samples, clips, effects, and so on. This area has been completely redesigned in Live 9, so if you own a previous version of the software, hit me up and I can send you a link to an earlier tutorial showing that. Rather than simply having switches down the left side now, there is a separate section entirely dedicated to the different types or locations of files you're looking for. In the upper half, it's categories which allows you to search for files by their type. And in the lower half, you have locations of files in the places section. Once you've clicked on one of those though, the navigation is basically the same as before, with the results then showing in the list to the right, after which they can be navigated in all the same ways, by clicking with the mouse or using the arrow keys on the computer keyboard, with the up and down keys moving up and down through lists and the left and right keys opening and closing folders. As you can hear, selecting results now previews them using Live's improved auditioning facility. As before though, this is stopped with the spacebar and turned on and off more permanently with the switch at the bottom and the preview volume set with the Q dial on the master channel. And a handy keyboard shortcut here is that if you have previewing turned off, you can still audition a selection by hitting shift and enter on your computer keyboard. Loading a selection is done, as always, by double-clicking it or dragging it into your set. So let's go through the different options in the left-hand list then, starting at the top. The first category is Sounds, and this is all your presets, be they individual instrument presets or instrument racks containing multiple instruments. The cool thing here is that the list on the right is now divided up by the type of sound, but includes all Live's instruments. So if I open up the bass folder now, then the list contains .adg and .adv files. The ADV options are all individual instruments, which could be Live's sampler instrument or one of its synthesizers. Whereas the ADG options are racks, which contain one or more instruments and often a chain of effects too. If you prefer to though, you can still search by instrument type rather than sound type, which is done by clicking on the instruments category. This then displays the list of live instruments, the folders for which can then be opened to see the available presets for that instrument, once again categorized into the type of sound the preset creates. The second option down is drums, and this is a cool one as it separates all the drum files off into their own section to make them easier to find. In the lower half of the list are all kits, which are predominantly drum racks, either loaded with samples or synthesized drums. And there's the empty drum rack option at the top here for creating your own kit. Just above this, you have a drum hits folder, which contains different types of drums. These can be simply audio files or one of live samplers loaded with the sample and processed with effects. Both of these can be dragged to drum rack slots, however, to become one of the drums in your kit. Effects browsing is completely identical to the previous browser, only now you have separate category switches for audio and MIDI effects. And as before, there's a plug-in switch for browsing to any AU or VST instruments or effects you may own. Activated in the same way, using the switches in the file folder section of Live's preferences. One thing that is completely new to Live's browser is Max for Live, which offers a load of additional effects and instruments to all Live 9 suite owners, as it's included for free with that. 
or is available for a small cost for owners of the standard version of Live. Essentially, the Max devices work the same way as other Live devices, in that you add them to audio or MIDI tracks in the same way, and they all come with a few different presets to try. We'll be looking some more at Max for Live later on in the advanced course. Two more brand new categories in the browser include clips and samples. Clips is a list of all the available audio or MIDI clips, which can be audio loops or MIDI clips playing instruments. And samples is all of the raw audio samples, so all instrument, drum, vocal or effect sounds at your disposal. The lower half of the left section is a quick way of accessing the different locations on your computer you might want to search for files in. One you may recognize from Live 8 is the library. This is all of the library content from Live 8, so there's no need to worry about losing anything when you upgrade Live because everything is available directly there. Then you have the current project option, which is a shortcut to your project folder, which will contain any audio files you've recorded, consolidated or collected into the project. Another option is the user library. This is a new area, which is entirely dedicated to any things you save yourself whilst working in live. So any devices you edit, or racks you build, or clips you create, and so on. And there's also an option for adding a new place yourself, if you want to have a permanent destination here for locating files, such as your sample library. This is set up very easily by simply clicking Add Folder, then navigating to the folder you want to be added to the list. Lastly, at the top of the Places list is a Packs option. This is a quick way of checking out any packs you have installed on your computer. For anyone who doesn't know, a live pack is a collection of live sounds, which can be anything from samples and clips, to devices or complete sets containing extra documents. Many packs are available in the suite, as well as there being more options that can be purchased from other manufacturers or downloaded from the Ableton website. Once downloaded, you simply double click the pack file to install it into Live. The individual components from the pack can then be browsed and loaded from the packs folder or using the category switches above, as a pack's contents are often loaded into the main library, so you'll see more options appearing in many of the sections lists when a new pack is installed. Finally, Live has an improved search facility, which means you can look for files in all categories simultaneously by their name. There's a useful keyboard shortcut here again too. You just hit Command and F on a Mac, or Control and F on a PC, then type in whatever you're searching for after which you get both device presets, clips and samples showing up in the list. Now I can use the up and down and return keys to choose one from the list. And the escape key to clear the search field. So hopefully that's left you with a much better understanding of how to get started with a new session. And also more of an idea about how the software works. That was just a quick tour of live though. And in the following lessons, we'll be going through everything nice and slowly, starting in the next lesson with a comprehensive look at how to import, edit and play with audio clips. See you then.